for nearly 25 years of 21st century radio, UFOs have been a major topic. But, as you know, we have mucho many major topics. If you want to spend a little time at the beach or in your yard or in bed for late night reading, this is the book on UFOs that you will enjoy the most. It's called UFOs in Wartime, What They Didn't Want You to Know by Mac Maloney. Accounts of hovering objects when war is imminent reach as far back as 312 A.D., when seen by Roman Emperor Constantine, remember we talked about him just a couple of weeks ago, Constantine I, as he led his troops into battle. They supposedly aided George Washington in winning the American Revolution. Boy, I hope they really did. Because <laughs> I really don't know if that's true. UFOs were also reported flying over Normandy on D-Day and were dubbed Foo Fighters by World War II pilots in Vietnam. An Air Force commander said they were plagued by UFOs. Even today, the reports continue to pour in as noiseless objects are seen darting over the battlegrounds of the Middle East. Now, these sightings, as inconceivable as they may seem, are made by soldiers, officials, news reporters. Why did these reports spike so drastically during wartime? Could it be mistaken aircraft or... Is it someone or something looking in on us? Mac Maloney grew up in Dorchester section of Boston. His father was a veteran of World War II and was an avid reader of military books. As a child, Mac started reading them as well, along with a lot of science fiction. He received a B.S. in journalism and a graduate degree in filmmaking from Emerson College. He was a sports reporter for two years after college before joining corporate America as a publicist for General Electric Company. Max started writing books in 1984 and has been doing it full-time since 1987, penning over 30 books. Yay! Way to go, Mac! Mac, how are you? I'm doing good, Bob. How are you doing? Now, how's your pitching arm? You still uh, got a good curveball? Uh, no, no, no but that went away about 10 years ago. No, uh, my I never had mine. I always tried to have a slider and a knuckleball, and I couldn't have those either. Well... I, I didn't have either of those either. Well, I guess that's the reason why I was 0 in 75, and then I had to give up. <laughs> well, uh, can you give examples of wartime UFOs made before the 20th century? Yes. Um, well, we have uh, in the book we have about 70 uh, episodes of military encounters with UFOs, and the first one we found um, was uh, in around 300 B.C., when Alexander the Great was in the process of conquering the known world, and he had uh, come to a strategic river crossing in East Persia, and um, he had a large army, a lot of cavalry, a lot of foot soldiers, but also war elephants. And as he was about to forge this, go over this river, um, his um, historians traveling with him reported that these flying shields uh, showed up uh, out of the sky and started buzzing his army and um, frightened his uh, war elephants and uh, the cavalry horses to the point where they would not cross the river. So that's like the earliest um, example that we've had of a military encounter with UFOs. Oddly enough, two years later, uh, Alexander the Great was laying siege to the city of Tyre, which is uh, in Lebanon and is actually a city that was built in a harbor off the coast of Lebanon. And um, he had laid siege to it for about a year, and his troops were building causeways across the harbor so they could attack the city. And as the story goes, these flying shields showed up again, and uh, this time they seemed to be on Alexander's side because um, the story says that uh, one of them shot some kind of a beam or whatever at a um, one of the walls of the city and uh, knocking it down and allowing Alexander's troops to go in and finally take over the city. So... Uh, as I said, that's that's really the earliest story that we could get that we found uh, having to do with military encounters uh, and UFOs. Well, I sure did love the account of 134 A.D., uh, or 1034 A.D., I'm sorry about that, because it's my favorite uh, ufologist is Jacques Vallée. Uh, my favorite shape is a cigar-shaped object. Mm -hmm. 
They're very, very popular, aren't they? Uh, I think that they are the most commonly reported uh, UFO shape, and that the saucer shape is the second most. But uh, oddly enough, the cigar-shaped object is is the um, is what most people see. Well, you know, I, I like them so much. My, in my first mural I did at Johns Hopkins University, I put several of them in the mural. Well, in Baltimore, they're pronounced murials. Uh, and uh, because th- I, they, they, um, I think it mainly was because of their shape. That is, um, I like a good cigar every now and then. Uh-huh. And I like the ones especially that had their little portholes. And I made uh-huh. sure I put a few with portholes in them. Well... I loved your book. I mean, I think I've read about 424 million UFO books. And uh, this book is truly enjoyable. You do a lot of important research in here that others haven't. And we'll touch on some of that a little later on. Uh, But especially, here's one that I really wish were true. The one with George Washington. Can you tell us a a little bit about this, please? Well... I should preface it by saying that when we were researching the book, we probably came up with about 200 candidate stories, let's say, and we had to pare them down to the 70 that finally um, wind up in the book. But there were a handful of, of stories um, that I can only describe them as just being too, too good not to include. Yeah. And, and, yeah. and this is one of them. Sure. Um, we, you know, we found uh, documentation or uh, other writings that said that when – George Washington was at Valley Forge at the lowest point of um, of the Revolutionary War. That uh, he and his um, men were befriended by uh, what they thought was a tribe of Native Americans, who they called the Greenskins. And mm-hmm. these people um, gave them uh, food and ammunition and uh, wood for their fires. They also gave them some sort of military intelligence on the British and the Hessians who were in the area. And um, they were said to have lived in a lodge that was saucer-shaped and that was sometimes there and sometimes not there. Mm-hmm. So from, you know, those reports, uh, you know, some people have speculated that these greenskins uh, might have been um, ETs or uh, occupants of the UFO who were on the scene helping Washington, you know, in, in, as they say in the worst part of the revolution. Yeah, well, Ancient Aliens did a little story on that, but I think you're Information in your book on page 11, etc., is, is would have, they should have called you. They should have. Because uh, um, every now and then, you know, shows that, 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 especially television shows, that put a great deal of an emphasis upon all, um, all highly emotional stuff is fine. But they need to do better research into this area here. Uh, and uh, I think I'd love for that story to be true. I really do would, sure. uh, but I don't know. I, I'm, I'm, it's not that I'm always skeptical, but I, I'm always skeptical about certain things about the founding fathers because so much has been written about them that is so inaccurate. Okay, now uh, you have a chapter on spaceships or scare ships, you call them, of 1909 that includes an early Men in Black story. Can you give us some details on this, please? Well, the scare ships were um, aerial vehicles that people were seeing in the east of England in 1909. Uh, they were shaped like Zeppelins. They were the size of Zeppelins, but they weren't Zeppelins because, for one thing, uh, the Germans, even though they had just invented the Zeppelin, they did not have uh, a Zeppelin that could make their 700 or 900-mile round trip from Germany to England. Uh, in 1909. Uh, also, people were seeing these things uh, in in the early spring of uh, 1909, which means that it would be very cold flying weather. And also, people who saw these scare ships, uh, you know, actually clocked them at going more than 200, 250 miles an hour. And even these days, our most modern blimps uh, can only do about 50 or 60 miles an hour. So, People started seeing these uh, scare ships. They were sub scare ships by uh, the British press. They were seeing them all over the place um, mm-hmm. in the spring of 1909. And uh, there was more than one because people would see more than one. And uh, these reports were all over England and even as far away as uh, Northern Ireland. Mm-hmm. And in one of the cases, a gentleman had seen a scare ship go over his house. He lived um, 
in a house on a cliff right on the um, English Channel. And a scare ship had gone over his house the night before. Lots of people saw it. The next morning, he found this very odd object uh, out on his cliff, let's say. And it looked, he described it as a soccer ball with a metal rod running through it. Hmm. No one had any idea what this thing was. The local police had no idea what it was. The Coast Guard had no idea what it was. So he was told to hang on to it until the British military could come and collect it. In that time, uh, he was away one day, and his, um, his maid was leaving to go somewhere, and she noticed these two uh, men dressed in black uh, who were kind of snooping around uh, his property, and they were looking in the area where uh, this weird object uh, had been found. Uh, they had stored the object in his mind, but the British military had picked it up by this time. But these two, uh, these two guys in black uh, were uh, looking in his, in his barn as well. And when she saw them and they saw her, they kind of both ran off in different directions. But after that, um, people started reporting that any time these scare ships would show up the next morning, they would see these, they would see these people dressed in black, hanging around, kind of, kind of looking around. Uh, maybe investigating what might have fallen out of these things or what might have happened, you know, when they went over. So um, it actually turns out to be, you know, the earliest um, recorded instance that I could find of a Men in Black episode. Mm -hmm. What do you really personally think about Men in Black? Who do you think they are? Well, I wish I knew. Um, you know... Well, could you speculate? Because sure. one of the good things about your work is, you know, you've read so widely and deeply in these areas, so your speculation is has great value. If I had to guess, I would say that they are probably government agents, even though I've read and seen descriptions of them, you know, kind of being uh, these uh, not-quite-human uh, characters. I could see parts of the government uh, having these plans to come and talk to people uh, to kind of... Uh, ward them off talking about UFOs or actually scare them or intimidate them uh, about talking about UFOs. I mean, um, mm -hmm. you know, um, there's certain instances where government agencies uh, do that all the time. Mm -hmm. So I think that there's a chance that as far as in, in the United States anyway, that they could be government agents. But again, like I said, I'd love to know because there's there's been reports of, of men in black. Well, uh, you know, here we have this one going back to 1909 and other reports of them and, you know, popping up in other places. So, you know, maybe they do have some kind of a otherworldly origin. Yeah, that that's, that is fascinating. It really is. Um, I was just trying to trying to recall one of my the Charles Fort. Do you what what do you remember what he thought about them? I, I don't know, really. Oh, OK. Well, anyway, uh, I think uh, <laughs> He was the most unusual UFO researcher, if you would. I don't think necessarily he thought they were just extraterrestrial, though. But that's something else altogether. Now, what kind of UFO sightings took place during World War One? Uh, this includes uh, this one includes, as you note here, the first man to shoot at a UFO while in flight. Well, what happened was um, in 1914. By that time, the Germans had perfected the Zeppelins and. The Zeppelins would come over uh, England and um, really were the first uh, aerial bombers. They would bomb British cities. But the, at the time, the British had not figured out a way to combat them. Um, later on, they would invent the incendiary bullet, which would be fired at Zeppelins, would, would catch the gas within the Zeppelins uh, a bag on fire, and, and the Zeppelins would blow up. But at, but at this point, 1914, they didn't have that type of technology. So what they used to do is they would send uh, airplanes up over major uh, British cities at night to serve as kind of a crude early warning system that, that these pilots, you know, would see the Zeppelins coming from, uh, you know, a, a distance uh, far off, uh, for, farther off than if someone on the ground was looking for them. And uh, that's what this one um, pilot was doing one night over London and he in, in January, and he came upon this, uh, aerial object that he thought was a Zeppelin, but he actually described it as looking like a railway car hmm. um, oh. with, with, with windows and lights behind the windows and so on. So uh, the only thing he was armed with was his pistol, and he pulled out the pistol and started firing at this thing. As soon as he did that, 
uh, it took off at tremendous speed, and it took off at such speed that, that he thought that he was actually crashing, and he actually did crash into a mosh. He destroyed his plane, but he, but he survived. But uh, as far as we could figure out, that's the first time uh, anyone shot at a UFO in flight. Mm-hmm. Well, we're going to take our first break of this hour. Our guest is Mac Baloney. UFOs in wartime, what they didn't want you to know. This is Dr. Jacques Vallée. You're listening to 21st Century Radio with Dr. Bob Hieronymus, the reference in the study of the paranormal. Oh, gosh, we just heard from Jacques just a little while ago. And uh, Okay, our guest is Mac Maloney, UFOs in Wartime, what they didn't want you to know, Berkeley Publishing, MacMaloney.com, and it's linked on the front page of 21stCenturyRadio.com. I wanted, you to, wanted to read something here. Uh, this is what he notes. UFOs are real simply by the sheer number of sightings made by military personnel during times of conflict. These people are in the middle of combat. They're not about to be making up a story or having a hallucination or perpetuating a hoax. Often they are fighting for their lives when they make these observations. In this way, they are the best witnesses we have trained pilots Sailors and soldiers, both officers, enlisted personnel, etc., etc., etc. Thank you for that statement, Mac. Uh, because I, you know, so many there have been in the past, especially with Psycop, who were putting down anyone who uh, re- reported a UFO, especially if they were an astronaut or <laughs> or, or or served in the military. It's a ter- it was terrible, uh, you know. They, you know what they said about the astronauts? Well, he's just a space jockey. What does he know? Jeez, a whiz, jeez, a whiz. Well, okay, I'm sorry. I was so proud of you for saying that, and and thank you for your focusing on uh, those who have served our nation. It's extremely important, especially today. Well, the um, the next area that I want to touch on is uh, concerning ghost flyers in 1934. Were, were you born in 1934? I was not, no. No, okay. No. Um, it, it, this is actually uh, probably my favorite chapter of the book because it's just so strange. It um, is. In 1934, actually the end of 1933, in a very remote section of uh, Sweden, uh, up near the Arctic Circle, uh, the, this place called Verstabon, uh, people started seeing these very unusual airplanes. They were um, they were very large. They had eight engines, and uh, there was uh, no airplanes flying at that time that had eight engines. Uh, eight they engines. had a twin um, beam uh, tail section uh, similar to a P-38 Lightning of World War II, and they had pontoons, and um, they were very loud, and they had searchlights attached to the under of the, uh, underneath of their fuselage, which these very powerful beams would shoot down to the ground. Um, so people started seeing these things in December 33, and then throughout the winter of 34, and of course in that part of the world, during the winter it's nighttime just about all the time, and um, they were seen doing very unusual things. They were, um, they would make a lot of noise. Uh, they would circle villages or railway stations or mountains endlessly all night long, just circling, circling, circling. People would be out in the streets looking at these airplanes, just endlessly circling villages. And, of course, even these days it would be hard to get an airplane to be able to circle anything for a stay airborne for, you know, eight to ten hours because you have to refuel. But for whatever reason, these airplanes didn't seem in need of refueling or not very often. Uh, people saw them playing in formation. There was there was lots of them. The Swedish military uh, sent up uh, airplanes to try to intercept them, and were never never able to do that. People in Finland and Norway saw them as well. Uh, there was at the time there was speculation that maybe this, these were German aircraft uh, being launched from an aircraft carrier up in the Arctic Sea or something, but uh, that couldn't have happened because the Germans never had an aircraft carrier. And even if they had some kind of a ship that was able to launch these huge aircraft, um, you know, just to do that in the middle of the night, in the middle of, like, the worst, some of the worst weather conditions in the world, we'd be hard-pressed to do that these days, never mind back in 1933, when when aircraft, you know, air flight uh, was actually in its infancy almost. Mm -hmm. Um, So um, 
And even if it was some kind of a German ship, it would have had to come back to get restocked in Germany, and and, and uh, there would have been a break in these things, uh, seeing these things. But they, there wasn't. They were seen steadily throughout uh, the winter and early spring of 1934. So, uh, and then they just went away, and uh, no one has, no one knows what they were. No one has ever come forward to say, you know, I was one of the ghost flyers, or the planes came from here or there, or uh, we don't know where. Um, they had just it's just a mystery what these things were and no one has ever been able to figure it out that is some serious mystery eight engines eight right. engines jeez a whiz mac wow that must have been a huge huge plane mm-hmm. mm. well i thank you for educating me in that particular area our listeners are going to be educated all over the place uh, <laughs> in in this work because of the depth in which you go and you know i think you're you you write so credible and, and, and so well at the same point. Well, after 30 books, I guess you got the hang of it, right? Well, the, it, the, the funny thing is is that um, this is my first nonfiction book in almost 25 years. Oh. Um, all my other books have been military fiction books and some science fiction. So, mm-hmm. you know, when the idea for this came up, I was just at lunch with my editor one day, and we were talking about how I, I always had this interest in UFOs and you know, military history and how they just kind of combined at one point. And I just got to think, it seems like UFOs show up more in times of wartime than not. And I, I was thinking, you know, is it because there's more airplanes up there, more opportunity to see UFOs or whatever? But anyway, he said, you know, that might be a good idea for a book, but it would have to be a nonfiction book. You know, mm-hmm. would you want to do that? So I said, sure, why not? And uh, and that's really how it all started. Um, so mm-hmm. uh, it, it, it's been interesting doing nonfiction. It's, it's more research. It took longer, but... It was also um, a lot of fun to do. Well, you, you write so well, it makes it even much more fun. Uh, maybe uh, uh, I think that that's really a reason why I could see myself, uh, even though I've read your book twice. And you should take, I'm going to hold my book up to the microphone right here uh, and, and take a look at these pages. See all those pages? You, every page is messed up. I've, re- <laughs> I've written all over it. It's become a, uh, I have now, a kind of a, an encyclopedia of your book, uh, because because there are so many important things in here. Now, your your book goes into uh, detail about the infamous 1942 UFO over Los Angeles episode, in which many people believe the city was attacked by UFOs. What do you think really happened? Well, you know, again, it, it it's really kind of hard to figure out. I mean, you know, the the short version is is that uh, on the Late night of February 24th and early morning February 25th in 1942, uh, over Los Angeles, the, the naval intelligence had told the people the, there was a lot of military in Los Angeles, a lot of civil defense people, because there was a lot of defense plants in Los Angeles, and so uh, in Los Angeles, and and there was a lot of anti-aircraft batteries and things of that nature there too. So they naval intelligence told them that they suspected that the Japanese were going to bomb Los Angeles that night. And uh, we were still having war jitters uh, because Pearl Harbor had just happened just uh, less, uh, about two months before. Uh, the day before, a Japanese submarine had surfaced off uh, a, a small town about 90 miles north of Los Angeles and, and fired on an oil refinery there. So people were sure the Japanese were in the area. But uh, sure enough, uh, early in the morning of the 25th, these things started showing up on radar. Uh, there were lots of them. Uh, people, uh, they blew the air raid siren, and, and at the time, L.A. had up 2 million citizens, and they figured at least half of them must have woken up and seen these things. Lots of um, newspaper reporters. They had uh, seven newspapers in Los Angeles at the time. Uh, they had reporters everywhere. Lots of them were on buildings with military people or with law enforcement people, and they just saw these things over Los Angeles, and um, they, were round, they were shaped like saucers. They were flying in Chevron formation. Uh, the aircraft, the anti-aircraft batteries opened up on them and, and kept firing for two and a half hours. So many anti-aircraft shells were fired at these things that when, when anti-aircraft shells explode and they don't hit anything, they come back down as shrapnel and they killed six people on the ground, did a lot of property damage, and um, uh, people saw these uh, anti-aircraft shells bursting on these things and having no effect on them. So. Uh, the culmination of all this was that uh, the Los Angeles Times uh, uh, photographer took a picture, which is, might be the best UFO picture ever taken, of one of these things caught in searchlights being fired at by anti-aircraft guns uh, over Los Angeles. And um, the L.A. Times gave us permission to uh, run that picture in the book. 
Um, the next day, uh, the UFOs finally went away. The next day, the Army and the Navy were at each other's throats trying to come up with some kind of an explanation of what had happened. The Navy said nothing happened, that this was total uh, war jitters, but the Army said, no, this was impossible. At the time, the Army was the Air Force as well. Uh, you know, they saw these things on um, radar, and so many people saw them on the, on the ground. Uh, they floated a story that they were actually airliners uh, disguised. Japanese had disguised airliners as uh, uh, bombers as airliners and had taken off from a secret base in Mexico, which was, you know, ludicrous. And uh, and then uh, the next day, the war censors just put a clamp down on all information about this, and it, and it basically went away because we had a war to fight. Um, so... Um, you know, exactly what happened, who knows? There's never been any kind of official government investigation into what happened, or at least one that was made public. Um, we have that photograph. We have lots of people who saw these things over Los Angeles, but, you know, what they were, impossible to say. It looks like you have an entire page from the Los Angeles Times. Is that Was that the entire page? That's the entire page. That's right. Yeah. That's terrific. That's terrific, because I've seen the other photograph before, but all, there's other one, two, three. There's seven other photographs of 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 uh, people pointing thing, you know, things holding things that that fell from the shrapnel and stuff like that. So, so congratulations on putting the whole thing in there rather than just a photo. Um, I, I, that's the kind of thing I think is really important to educate people in this particular area. You know, the problem is. Is this is we need four hours to do this book, because there are so many many good uh, chapters that we're not going to even have a time to touch on. Uh, one, of course, is the Foo Fighter sightings in World War II, and whether or not they were Germans or Japanese. What did they know about them? What about people who contend Foo Fighters were secret Nazi super weapons? You go through all of this in great detail, and it and it's very credible. Now, uh, there is one thing we really need to talk about that all of my friends who are UFO researchers are going to beat me up if I, if I uh, <laughs> utter, utter uh, your perspective on Roswell. But I think it's an important perspective. What do you believe happened in Roswell? Well, I don't think anything happened at Roswell. Um, I, as I said before, I, I've read uh, UFO lots of UFO books as a kid. Every UFO book I could get my hands on, I read. Um, and you didn't start hearing about Roswell until the late 70s or early 80s, uh, when it was kind of brought back to the forefront um, through the National Enquirer and other means. And um, if you just go and look at the photographs, for instance, um, I-, I was just watching something on TV, like on the Discovery Channel one night, and this is even before we started the book, and they just laid out the photograph of the debris that the Air Force said that they found, and also uh, the debris from one of these uh, spy balloons that they were launching in the area at the time. They were launching these balloons to float over the Soviet Union with acoustic devices in them to see if they could pick up any evidence that the Russians were working on an atomic bomb. And they just kind of fit these two things together. And if you see it, it just, you know, you can see that, that what they found in the field uh, what's in that photograph is the wreckage from the kite of one of these spy balloons. So I, 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 I wanted to believe in Roswell. In fact, at, at one point in the 80s, they were going to send an archaeological team down there to do a dig in the debris field, and I volunteered to go because I wanted so much to believe in it. But just the more I looked into it, the more I saw of these things, and then uh, more books have come out, and now I think that, you know, the count is up to you know, there's 12 just that it crashed there, and dozens of bodies, and, you know, the military, you know, silencing people and everything. And it, to me, it's just like too many moving parts to this story. Why would all these UFOs crash at Roswell? Um, uh, so I, I just think that there's just a lot of impossibilities into the current Roswell story. And, and I'm not saying that there hasn't been other disks found in other places and recovered by the U.S. military, and they're hiding them, but... I just don't think it happened at Roswell. I would like to, I, 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 I'd like someone to change my mind, um, but um, right now I don't think anything happened there. Well, when we get back, because we're going to take a break here, we have to talk about the Maury Island incident. Uh, you do it at length. Thank heavens you do it at length, because there's a lot of abbreviated uh, stories about this. The Maury Island incident. You want to study up on that before we come back? Good. All right. <laughs> as if 
<laughs> as if you don't know it by heart, right? Okay, our guest is Mac Maloney. UFOs in wartime, what they didn't want you to know. Now, okay, Maury Island. Oh, I've been looking forward to reading more and more about this particular. Tell us about the Maury Island incident. Well, it began in uh, the summer of 1947, and it happened right after Kenneth Arnold had his famous, quote-unquote, flying saucer sighting. Um, I'm sure people know that story. He was the first person to, after seeing... Uh, strange things in the sky that couldn't be identified. He he told the press that they looked like saucers skipping across a pond, and from that the media created the name Flying Saucers. So, um, and he was just a businessman who happened to be flying his private plane that day. But um, what happened was uh, actually three or four days before that, there was a gentleman uh, named Harold Dow, and he had a uh, business in Tacoma, Washington, uh, where he would go out in a boat. Uh, with with some crew members, and they would pick up uh, trees that had been uh, cut down by logging companies that somehow got into the water and um, got away from them. And his company, what they used to do is they'd retrieve these trees and bring them back to the lumber company so they could be uh, harvested and so on. So he was out there one day off of uh, an island in uh, near Tacoma, Washington, called Maury Island. And it, they saw he, his son, and two crew members run the boat, and saw these uh, handful of UFOs suddenly appear above them. Uh, they looked like large donuts, and they could see uh, lights uh, spinning around on the outside and on the inside of them, and they would just, you know, at first they thought they were balloons, but the longer they saw, had these things in sight, they, they realized that these things were things that they had never seen before. So the, they, as they watched, they saw that one of these UFOs seemed to be uh, having some kind of um, technical difficulty, seemed to be faltering, and all this was happening right over their boat. And um, at one point, one of the uh, other UFOs came up to this uh, disabled UFO, let's say, and, and seemed to send an electrical charge into it. When this happened, uh, this, the stricken UFO uh, expelled uh, tons of this material, which, which they described as slag. Uh, onto into the water and and onto the coast of Maury Island. Now, in the in while this was happening, uh, Dow um, uh, beached his boat on Maury Island, and he and the crew uh, uh, took uh, cover from this slag that was falling out of the sky. And actually, it it injured his son and, and killed the dog that they had with oh. him. So they watched this fantastic um, uh, scene going on, and finally, the disabled UFO seemed to regain power, and and together they all just shot off at tremendous speed, and they were gone in the blink of an eye. So uh, Dow and his crew were, you know, very, uh, you know, the shock, let's say, and uh, they got back in their boat, went back to Tacoma, and uh, he got medical treatment for his son. And they also vowed not to talk to anyone about this. Now, the next morning, uh, a guy came to, a man came to Dow's house, and uh, Dow at first thought that he was an insurance salesman, and he said, I would like to talk to you, so they went to breakfast. As they're having breakfast, uh, this gentleman, who was dressed in black, uh, started to recount a lot of things that Dow had seen over Maury Island the day before, almost as if this guy was there or intimately knew the details of it. And he warned Dow that if he told anyone about this, uh, that uh, bad luck would come to him, to his family, so on and so forth, and really threatened him into uh, being silent. Uh, Dow went to work later on that day and decided not to, uh, you know, uh, keep quiet about it. And he told the whole story to his boss, uh, a gentleman named Fred Crispin. Now, Crispin's name is going to be important uh, at the end of the story. Anyway, Crispin went out to Murray Island uh, later on, and he too, uh, well, he said he also saw UFOs there. So uh, now they had both sighted of these things, and uh, they wrote to a science fiction magazine in Chicago about what had happened. Now, this is all just in the same time frame as uh, Kenneth Arnold had seen his UFOs, his flying saucers. And the uh, science fiction magazine decided to do a story on this. And who did they send out to Tacoma to do the story but Kenneth Arnold, the yes, guy who had so. seen the first quote-unquote flying saucers. Even mm -hmm. though he wasn't a journalist, the magazine editor thought he would be a good pick to do the story. Mm -hmm. So uh, Dow and Crispin and Kenneth Arnold get into a hotel room, and Kenneth Arnold starts to interview them. As he's doing this, the phone rings, and it's a newspaper man from a uh, Tacoma newspaper, and he's saying, I don't really know who you gentlemen are or what you're doing there, but I have someone on the other line who is telling me every word that you, is being said in your hotel room. Oh. 
so uh, Kenneth Arnold and the other two are, you know, very uh, surprised to hear this, and they sweep the room for bugs, electronic bugs, uh, listening devices. They can't find any. Uh, but at that point, uh, Kenneth Arnold decided that they should get the military involved, and he had some contacts in the military that he had met um, since his sighting uh, of the flying saucers. So he made some phone calls, and the next day, uh, two um, Air Force pilots, intelligence officers, flew up in a B-25 uh, bomber from California to Tacoma to talk to Dow and Chrisman and Kenneth Arnold. Um, they landed in Tacoma, uh, went to the hotel room, and now the five of them are in the hotel room, and they're talking about what happened. They have some of the slag with them, and wouldn't you know, the, report, the uh, newspaper reporter calls up again and says, the same thing. I can hear everything that's going on mm. inside that hotel room. Mm. It was like someone was able to listen in on them. At that point, the military men thought, okay, this is a little too strange for us. We're going to get out of here. They took a sample of the slag, went back to the airport, uh, had a brief um, session with the uh, air base's intelligence officer, uh, then got on the plane to fly back to California. And within a half hour, those two men were dead. Mm. because mm -hmm. their plane crashed uh, very close to where Kenneth Arnold saw his flying saucers. Mm -hmm. Well, at that point, and when Kenneth Arnold found out about this, he, he thought, this is just getting too strange for me. So he called up the magazine editor in Chicago and said, I'm off the job. I'm not a journalist. I don't want to be involved in this anymore. He got back in his plane and took off, and it turns out that there was something wrong with his plane, and he almost crashed. Luckily, he was such an accomplished pilot, he was able to land, and something had gone wrong with his engine, something very unusual. Um, so the FBI got involved in this, and um, even though a lot of people accused Dahl and Chrisman as uh, coming up with this hoax, the FBI later on there's cables that that you know you can we found in the research where um, J. Edgar Hoover was sure that this was not a hoax. His FBI agents in Tacoma assured him this was not a hoax. That Chrisman and Dahl believed in what they were saying, and. Um, Odd things did happen to Dow. His his uh, his wife got very sick. Uh, he had marriage problems with her. The son disappeared. Showed up in Nebraska. Couldn't remember how he got there. All this really weird stuff started uh, happening. And um, some people who've looked into it think that this could be some kind of a counterintelligence operation. If you peel away a couple of the onion layers, uh, it looks like there might be something like that going on. Other people have no idea what had happened, hmm. and still don't. Yeah. Um, but the strange thing is, is um, um, Kenneth Arnold went on to talk about this, uh, you know, later on in life. But the very odd thing is, is Fred Chrisman, Dow's boss, was actually called before a committee years later investigating uh, the JFK assassination, because um, people who know about that assassination know that it, that right after it happened, the police picked up three hobos on a railroad tr railroad track nearby the assassination spot. And one of them had Fred Christman's name in, 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 his, uh, in, his, in his pant pocket. So what all this means, no one has ever been able to figure out, but it's a very strange story. It sure is. And thank you for doing such a good job on that one. A lot of uh, people didn't go deep enough. to. to... Now, we we just got a few minutes left, and there are so many important uh, topics in here. But I got to go to, uh, first, by the way, uh, let me jump ahead near the end of your book. And um, when you, where you ask, uh, well, basically, don't put the U.S. military in charge of, um, of this type of research because it, we've run into some enormous problems because of that. So I wanted to make that point that you make uh, with, throughout your work. But also, what about, let's finish up with the UFO incursions of U.S. IBM bases in the 60s and the 70s. Well, uh, yeah, that's another story that not many people, you know, really realize happened. I mean, we had the um, Cuban Missile Crisis in 1962 where, you know, U.S. and Russia almost went to war because of putting nuclear missiles in Cuba. But just as soon as that was uh, settled, we started putting ICBM missiles in the, um, into silos in the middle part of the U.S. And as soon as this started happening, uh, people started seeing UFOs appearing over these bases. And for the next 15 years or so, or actually it's supposedly still going on today, but it was very heavy in the 60s and the 70s, UFOs would show up over these bases with uh, some frequency, and they would um, typically what would happen is the UFO would come over, these silos were spread out all over the prairie, miles apart, and they would hover over a um, 
silo and, and something in the, in the missile that was waiting on the ground, something would go wrong, either the power would go off or the targeting system was um, skewed. Uh, sometimes they would lose, uh, you know, all information having to do with the launch codes, things like that. And, and there were instances where UFOs just would, you know, in one night would go over 150 silos and each one of them would lose power and then the UFO would move on and the power would come back on. Dozens of people saw these things, probably hundreds. The U.S. Air Force completely denied everything. They would happen at uh, places up, nuclear bases up in Maine, all the way across the country to Colorado in the same night. Mm-hmm. Um, and the um, U.S. military looked into it uh, very deeply. There's a 170-page report that they put out on it, but at the last minute, instead of using the words UFOs, they uh, blacked it out and put in black helicopters, unknown mm-hmm. helicopters. So mm-hmm. they know more about this than, than uh, they're letting on. As I said, I've heard lately that um, you know it, it's still going on. Robert Hastings wrote a book called UFOs and Nukes, which is the Bible on this thing. Very, very scary situation that UFOs might have some kind of control over our nuclear forces. And, of course, we, we basically have been told time and again that they really, uh, UFOs have uh, really do not uh, cause any threat. I believe they're tinkering around with our ICBMs could be interpreted as a possible threat. Do you? A threat while they're trying to send us a message. Mm-hmm. I mean, the message being, and this has happened with Russian ICBMs as well, the message being is that, you know, we can control these things. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, not just you. We can control them. We can shut them off. We can retarget your missiles. So, you know, I think it's, it's, it's they're trying to give us a message, and I think the message is, is that you better watch what you do with these things. Sure, and I think we better watch what we do with these things. So... When do you think uh, the government will come clean and tell us that, uh, well, there might be a UFO or two somewhere? I don't think they'll ever come clean. I, I think that what's, what's going to solve the UFO puzzle is that uh, at some point, um, maybe in the next two or three decades, that the scientific community will get to the point where it's no longer uh, you know, considered um, you know, foolish to investigate UFOs. And only when the scientific community is given... Um, you know, the okay to look into them and given the funding to look into UFOs, I think that's the only time, that, that will be the first time that we find out exactly what they are. Of course, unless one of them lands on the White House lawn at some point. Mm-hmm. I don't think that's likely. I think that uh, it's going to be the scientists who reveal to us what UFOs are. I think that the military has been covering these things up since 1947 or even earlier. Uh, you're never going to get the true story out of the military, I'm uh, sad to say. Yeah, as you say, uh, the Pentagon cheapened out when it came to studying UFOs. The institute that historically overspends on everything chose to nickel and dime this very important matter. Why? There's only one answer. They did it because they never intended to do a good job in the first place. In fact, the goal all along was to do the worst job possible. Good going, Mac. Great job. Thanks, Bob. Thank you for joining us on 21st Century Radio, Mac. Uh, Please hang on the line when we say goodbye. We'll be right back. 21st Century Radio is produced by Hieronymus and Company. Our executive producer and research assistant is Laura Cordner. Our engineer is Anita Brockington. And I'm Dr. Bob Hieronymus.